Hello, full of Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. So big news today. Absolute tragedy in Baltimore. This huge shipping boat actually struck a bridge. Most of you have heard about this, and the bridge collapsed completely. We're going to go to a video that actually showed it taking place. And this is unbelievable. So make sure you're sitting down for this one. And I want to first and foremost say that this, I want to acknowledge this is a human tragedy. And I, I'm guessing there were people on the bridge. I don't know how many fatalities, but that's obviously our number one priority. But I also want to dive into the economics, what this means. And I think one of the main takeaways you'll get from this video is how intricate our economy is. And it's very much like nature. And that if you just tweak one little thing over here, it can have this domino effect that can turn into like this huge, massive catastrophe globally. It's like, it's like the butterfly effect. If you guys have heard of that before, a butterfly flaps its wings in Singapore, and this creates a, a tsunami in Florida or something like that. And uh, when we go through how this is going to impact logistics, not just on the East Coast, but around the globe, you, you see how fragile these systems are and how important it is that we make sure that the government gets out of the way and the government doesn't step in to an even greater degree and create these economic distortions in a system that, I mean, you just blow the wrong way. You have some sort of black swan event, even at a local level, and it just it brings down the whole thing. It's really shocking. So, and then I want to try to understand why. I've read a couple stories and or a couple articles, and I can't figure out how this happened. Like, what's interesting, Zero Hedge pointed out that the guys driving might have been Ukrainian. I don't want to say that has anything to do with it but i think it's a significant fact but then i want to show this video that would imply this had nothing to do with the drivers whatsoever and had to do with a malfunction of the boat but then that begs the question how how can <laughs> like did you not check this thing prior to letting it go out of the port and think about how many times these types of boats go in and out probably on a daily basis. And did they just overlook their, their checklist? Or I mean, this is crazy, crazy stuff. So let's get into it and go straight to our first screen share where I want to show you this video of the boat actually hitting the bridge. And this is courtesy, let's see, I'm scrolling down here. Here we go. So they talk, uh, this person who, uh, Tom Fitton on Twitter, he says the video shows a repeated power loss, which would imply this had nothing to do with the drivers whatsoever. But again, we, we, we just don't know. But watch this video. See if I can enlarge it. There we go. So you see the boat and the power goes out right there. Boom, nothing. And you start to see the back end start to turn like this heading for that pillar. And here the power comes back on. And so you can, I'd imagine these guys are freaking out right now. And they're trying to turn the wheel or whatever it is. And look, smoke starts coming out the top. They lose power again. And the back end is just coming around like that as they head right into this support column. Look at that.
I'm at a complete loss of words. Again, the, the, the priority has to be thinking about the human beings that are involved in this and their families and just obviously your heart goes out to those people. But on this channel, we've got to try to figure out you know, what happened. And then we have to look at the economic ramifications and, and put the pieces of the puzzle together. So my base case right now, based on this video, is it was a malfunction with the boat. I mean, unless the, the guys purposely did that for some sort of alibi, I, mean, I don't even want to go there right now. But it looks like just somehow there was, but again, you would think there, was, there would be redundancies on the boat that would prevent that from happening. So even if you did have a power outage, there would be some sort of plan B and plan C set up that would immediately kick in to make sure this never, ever, ever happens. It's one thing to lose power when you're out there on the ocean. I, I mean, I would assume. <laughs> I have no experience in, in driving boats or anything. But it's a whole other issue, obviously, if you lose power in a port, and that's what these ships at the end of the day are, are meant for. So I had a lot of questions going into it. This answers some of the questions, but unfortunately I think this leads to more questions that I didn't even have at the beginning. But now let's get into the economics and to do this, I want to redo the screen share and go back over to CNBC. I've got a bunch of stuff highlighted. And this is where you're really going to see how interconnected the economy is and how this plays into the prices of the stuff you buy daily. And at the end of the day, we can talk about AI, we can talk about disruptive technology, we can talk about all this stuff. But where rubber meets the road is these good old fashioned businesses of just taking stuff <laughs> and moving it from point A to point B. No matter how many chat GPTs we have, they, they can't get the sugar from Baltimore to Singapore. Or they can't get the coal from Australia over to China. We, we still need these old school businesses. That is the core of civilization. And taking that a step further, it just shows us how reliant we are on things like energy. Coal, natural gas, oil, etc. If you think that's going away just because you go out and buy a Tesla, think again, my friend. But let's get into the CNBC article. Josh, can you see this? Yep. Okay. So logistics company scrambles after bridge collapse, closes port of Baltimore until further notice. Logi the key talking points, logistic providers are urgently working to update clients on the status of their imports. After the bridge was shut down, Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed on Tuesday after the 10,000 container capacity vessel Dolly collided with the bridge pillar. Rescue efforts are on the way. Mm. There will be dozens of diversions. That's an understatement. So let's get into the meat of the article here. So first, a quote from Paul Brasher, Vice President of Dry Dreyage. Uh, it looks like a logistics company. Our first priority is engaging clients to make plans for containers that we originally routed to Baltimore that will be discharged at other ports on the eastern seaboard. So here's where we get into the domino effect. We have to realize it's not just stuff leaving Baltimore, but stuff coming in. Then 
you have to look at the other ports increasing their capacity. How do you do that just from a human resources standpoint? But then you have to look at it from a trucking standpoint as well. So these trucks are picking up the stuff and moving. How does that work when they have to now go to a different port? Does that add time? Does that add cost? Are there regulations that would prevent certain drivers from, I mean, I don't know. These are all questions that need to be answered, but these are all questions that, that show how our economy, even in a free market system, is kind of this Jenga puzzle. And if you take out the wrong piece at the bottom, and the bottom is logistics and energy, no matter how much cool AI <laughs> you've got at the top, it comes crashing down. So at the time of the collision, this vessel was headed for Sri Lanka. They go into the, this port was vitally important for the, the, the U.S. as a whole. I mean, looks like for the global economy, but specifically for cars. It looked like the port of Baltimore is the top American port for import and export of autos and light trucks, as well as wheeled farm vehicles and construction machinery. Last year, the port handled 847,000 cars and light trucks. Look at this picture. On top of that, it was a huge port for sugar and gypsum. Uh, I don't, I mean, obviously we know what sugar is used for gypsum. Um, I'm sure is used on thousands of different types of materials. Uh, but the one thing that comes to my mind being a real estate guy is drywall. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> it's been a long time since I rehabbed. I'm almost positive drywall is made out of gypsum. Someone can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But re regardless, you see how this one event can cause something else over here, which can impact something over here, which impacts something over there, which eventually leads to the consumer paying higher prices. Now, how long this lasts, who knows? They go on to talk about how the bridge, or obviously they're, they're, it's gonna take a long time to get that cleaned up and rebuilt. Uh, they were talking about two years, but I, I'm not, you know, let's just call a spade a spade here. Uh, Baltimore isn't the most efficient city in the world right now. Baltimore's got a lot of problems. It had a lot of problems before this. Now, is the federal government, are they going to make this a priority, try to set an example to rebuild this thing quickly? I don't know. We'll have to follow it, the story, and see how it evolves. But, I mean, if this was just up to Baltimore, if the last three or four years is any indication of their level of efficiency moving forward, if they're projecting two years, likely going to be five years. <laughs> or, or likely, who knows? Who knows? So this impacts retailers, Home Depot, Bob's Furniture Mart, IKEA, and Amazon are just some of the companies that use the port to impact or to uh, use the port to import goods. So it's not just imports, it's exports. Matt Castle, VP of Global Forwarding, explained to CNBC there should be minimal delays for trucks coming into the port area from the north, but the trucks coming into the area from the south will have to take I-95 or I-895 tunnels. So there you go. Normally, the trucks would take the bridge to get to where they were going, and that's if they're not even using the port, but now they're going to have to go and take another route that's going to cause traffic. Who knows what knock-on effects you have there. 
you know, we as consumers forget when we go into a Whole Foods, you go into a Walmart, Target, we just go in there to buy something and we never ever think about how this got here. We just think that the logistics genie came in and just waved the magic wand and somehow this thing that was created in China is just sitting on the shelf at Lowe's. We don't even put the pieces of the puzzle together. But when you do, you see how much really power the trucking industry has. <laughs> I mean, if they want to shut you down, they're shutting you down. And it's uh, it, it really comes to the forefront when there's events like this that, that, that happen. There could be a disruption of gasoline availability in the Baltimore area. Since some ethanol comes in by barge and rail gasoline shipped from the Gulf Coast refineries by pipeline is blended with 10% ethanol, which is delivered into the Baltimore area via train and barge. The oil industry will have to find an alternate supply route for these barge deliveries, which in the short term can be met by trucking. You know what's interesting to me is the whole climate alarmist group Let's just call them the the far left for a moment. I know it's over general over generalizing, but this the, the team climate disaster. They're very good at looking into all of these unintended consequences and the daisy chain of events in the environment. So if you increase the open temp uh, the ocean temperature by one degree, let's say. This is their argument. You will impact this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And the next thing you know, it leads to the whole world imploding. But yet, for some reason, they can't take those same analytical abilities and apply them to the economy. <laughs> As if you could just do anything to the economy, it doesn't even matter. But yet, if you raise the ocean temperature by point zero 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 one degree, then the next thing you know, in 50 years, the human race is eradicated. It's, it's really wild how a group can get so hyper-focused on one thing as far as the detail, the minutia, the nuance, and then just be oblivious to it just based on nothing other than ideology or oblivious to something that is just as intricate. Anyway, getting back to the article. Talking about oil deliveries, another route. Impact on exporters, top exporters out of Baltimore include coal, nat gas, aerospace, aerospace parts, uh, agricultural components, soybeans. For that, I, as soon as I heard coal, you guys know that I, I love coal long-term as far as an investment. So one of the companies that was impacted directly was a company called Console Energy. Now, this is not investment advice. It's just something that I looked up because I'm not saying this is one of those times, but often this is a great buying opportunity. And so we look at their five-year chart, which is, if you're a technical analyst type person you would there they might be coming to some uh, support levels here but uh pe ratio four and boy oh boy looks like uh they're going to be benefiting from the price of coal going up over the next 10 or 15 years assuming that we're in a long-term super cycle I and mean, look at this back during the cerveza sickness they got down to five bucks roughly 502 459 438, 430, 411. Wow. This probably did better than Bitcoin. Jeez. <laughs> uh, so maybe one to put on your watch list. Let's get back to CNBC.
here's where they talk about how long it'll take to get things back to normal. Two years, there will be a significant dis disruption in cost infrastructure project. In 1977, when the bridge was built, looks like it cost $60 million. Obviously, it's going to be a lot more than that now. Uh, the DALI is insured by Britan Britannia Steam Ship Insurance. So it looks like the insurance companies are going to be bearing the, the, the bulk of this cost. Uh, but then that begs the question, well, what's the counterparty risk? And are they going to be able to handle it? Maybe this puts them out of business, something we're going to have to pay close attention to. Now let's get back over to the Zero Hedge article because they've got some further insights. So I'm going to switch up the screen share. I guess I didn't even need to do that. All right. Okay, getting to Zero Hedge. Black Swan event, General Flynn raises questions about Baltimore Bridge. So I'm not going to go into maybe some of the reasons as to why this happened. I think Alex Jones interviewed General Flynn, and you can watch that uh, on his platform. I didn't get into what his theories or hypotheses are. Here's where they talk about the guys being Ukrainian, but... Again, I you know after watching that video, I I sure wouldn't want to throw these guys under the bus. I think they most likely were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. And if it was in fact a malfunction, which it looks like, I mean, you got to feel really really bad for those guys. So President Biden is going to do some sort of speech, give us remarks. Not that anyone cares. <laughs> Here you go. Some more insights. Bloomberg reports that the main, year, the main automobile companies that are impacted are going to be Mazda, Mercedes, Subaru, Mitsubishi, and Volkswagen. And they give you a chart of the exposure they have to this port. And here's where we get into the coal company. So this is console energy right here, and that's where the bridge collapse happened. So anything they have, it, it's going to be two years sitting there unless they can get it to another port and get it out that way, which I'm sure is what they're going to do. But what does this do? This, to a small degree, reduces supply. It's going to increase cost. Now, it might not move the needle that much, but who knows? Maybe it will. And this goes to show you that if we had, heaven forbid, something like a, I mean, I hate to even mention it, but if you have like a, a world war, just times this by a million. And that's the type of disruptions you would see. And in that world, I don't know how prices don't skyrocket. Even, even, even if you don't have money supply going I mean, I have to do the math on that and think that through. It, it, I think my base case there would be prices skyrocketing and then at a certain point coming back down and just having a, a deflationary bust. Because I don't know that even if you have, I mean, commodity prices just ripping higher, you have very inelastic demand which takes purchasing power away from everything else, which increases unemployment, which reduces demand for commodities. But there again, uh, commodities, even in a recession or a depression, demand is very inelastic. So th that would be something that hopefully we won't see happen. We've got a sugar factory or sugar refinery here as well. Cruise ship terminal. Okay, so here's an update on the bridge itself. Unclassified report from the DHS National Operations Center say the 
container ship lost propulsion. Okay, yep, yep. That's what it looks like based on that video. It's just like the power went out. But, but I mean, how do they not have redundancies that would prevent that? I, th there's, we'll have to follow this story. I'm sure there's going to be more details that come out in the, in the upcoming weeks. The bridge was undergoing maintenance, but was open to traffic. USCG reports motor. Yeah, I mean, thank heavens that it happened when it did. I mean, can you imagine if that would happen during like rush hour traffic? Wow. Here's another update. Bloomberg's Brendan Murray explains how the collapsed bridge blocking the only shipping lane in and out of the port. He's about to speak. Okay. Yeah, we get it. Oh, it's also the main route for hazardous materials, which aren't allowed to be transported through tunnels. Okay, that's a problem. Radioactive materials, such as bottled propane gas. I don't know what other type. I don't know if that's radioactive. Maybe they're talking about that end radioactive end hazardous materials on top of the bottled propane gas. But uh, this is an example of something that you can't just say, oh, no problem. We'll just send that up to the port in New Jersey and they'll handle it. This guy, and I'm not saying this is my position, just FYI, authorities are heavily downplaying the risk of foul play. We don't see anything that relates to that at this time. It's an open investigation, but there's nothing that points to that. No indication of how or now of nefarious intent for the White House like they'd admitted anyway. The thing that is a head scratcher for me is how on earth there weren't any redundancies to back up a power outage for a boat that size going through a harbor. That, that is inconceivable to me. So that's what's going on right now, guys. Really a tragedy. Again, our number one priority should be the human beings and their families that are involved here. But outside of that, the main takeaways are, number one, it could impact prices, definitely impact supply chains and logistics on the East Coast, and to a certain extent, globally. And this just reminds us, at the end of the day, our society is all about the transportation of goods and energy. It, it's stuff and getting stuff from point A to point B. And it also reminds us that this economy we have is very interconnected and it is exactly like a Jenga puzzle. And if you take out the wrong piece, that could not only impact the fragility or the stableness of the puzzle, but it could bring the whole thing down. And outside of the human element of, of war, or world war, uh, we have to realize that even if the United States isn't impacted directly, indirectly, we will be, and we will be getting a lot poorer as a result of having less stuff and the stuff we do have being much more expensive until it gets to the point where my base case would be it causes a deflationary bust. As always, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market, capitalism. Definitely want to get your tickets to Rebel Capitalist Live. We're living in some tumultuous, volatile times, to say the least. So you definitely want to figure out how to protect your portfolio, survive and thrive in this crazy world, and more importantly, protect, protect your freedom and personal liberty. And that's all the things that we're going to be discussing at Rebel Capitalist Live. Get your tickets at rebelcapitalistlive.com. See you in the next video.